bless you again. Uh, what a, a great opportunity it is to be able to share from the word of the Lord this morning. Uh, I'm going to invite you to head to uh, the passage of Acts in chapter number two, the book of Acts chapter number two. We are continuing in this, the third week following the Easter uh, resurrection uh, experience. And we are going to continue for the next few weeks to wrestle with what does it mean for us to live in light of of resurrection and certainly uh, we continuing to make sense of all that is going on around us uh, what does God say to us what does God want us to know what does God want us to do and certainly what does it mean for you and I to be faithful in this time so Acts chapter number 2 verse number 14 uh, is where we'll start and then we'll jump down to verse 36 uh, just to help give us a little bit of a context the book of Acts is uh, one of uh, the, the most explosive uh, 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 accounts of the way in which the church thrived during difficult times. That one argues that throughout history, the church much, uh, experiences much of its growth and much of its expansion, much of its uh, 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 power um, gathering from the spirit uh, when it is enduring hard times. Um, it is a, 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 a consistent narrative through uh, the, the, the New Testament um, epistles and, and all the accounts that uh, God did great things through the followers of Jesus who were filled and fueled by the Holy Spirit. Um, and I believe that the same God that uh, has allowed the church in times past to grow and to expand and to reimagine herself. Uh, this same uh, reimagining process is happening to you and I even right now, and it is not just something that is happening for the church, it's happening for our families, it's happening for you, it's happening for our country, for our culture, dare I say the world, a radical reimagining of who we must be in light of what God is doing in the world. This is, I think, an opportunity for us, uh, particularly on the heels of resurrection, to sit with and to think through, God, what are you asking of us in this time? So Acts chapter number two, verse 14, uh, starting off, and we'll jump quickly down to verse 36. Uh, we are hearing the account as uh, the gospel writer Luke, uh, who really in his uh, time of, of discipleship uh, pulled together uh, some of the highest and most uh, uh, eyewitness accounts and and helped to retell this great story of of what Jesus did in the Gospel of Luke and how the church lived that out in the book of Acts. And so we're going to uh, invite you to join us as we read. It should be popping up on your screen. Uh, Acts chapter two, verse 14. And it says this. But Peter, standing with the eleven raised his voice and addressed them. Going down to verse number 36. Therefore, Peter is saying, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty. Everybody say, know with certainty. May the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made Jesus both Lord and Messiah. This Jesus, everybody say that, this Jesus, this Jesus, and it's important because uh, there's all kind of versions of Jesus running around out here, but we're talking about a particular Jesus, this Jesus, whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins may be forgiven and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is for you for your children and for all who are far away everyone somebody say everyone Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And Peter testified with many other arguments and exhorted them 
uh, and exhorted them, excuse me, uh, saying, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed this message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, let us all just say thanks be to God. We are going to spend uh, the next few moments. Uh, I just want to open up this passage a little bit. Uh, I feel and felt and 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 was compelled by uh, verse certainly number 40 that declares us to save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And that will be the title of our message today, Saving Ourselves. Amen. Saving Ourselves. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. And we ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we won't sin against you. And may the preaching and the teaching of your word, Lord, be easy for those that hear and may their lives, Lord, be encouraged in ways that are indescribable. In Jesus' name we pray that the people of the way say amen. Amen. Just put that in the, in the chat, if you will, saving ourselves. This is the message, the title of what we will talk about today. Now, the book of Acts, particularly Acts chapter 2, in many of us who have uh, come up in the kind of Pentecostal, uh, charismatic uh, tradition, uh, find Acts chapter 2 to be one of the most seminal books, chapters in the biblical text. Uh, for us, it particularly lays out a very clear ordis salutis, if you will. It is uh, described and even prescribed as the way we understand the pathway to salvation. It is for us uh, the way in which we can declare beyond a shadow of a doubt that if we take these ordered steps, these structured uh, pathways, these decisions we make, then we can indeed have confidence and assurance that salvation is being extended to us. I want you to just appreciate that for a moment, that uh, there is indeed a set of steps, a pathway that has been both described and prescribed for you and I to be able to have confidence that if we do these things, Salvation made possible by the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus can and will be extended to us. This is not to say or mean that, you know, sometimes God uh, throws in a little hip-hop remix, if you will, of, of, of how God chooses to save because the longer you live, the more you begin to testify that sometimes God goes out of the norm to secure our salvation. Do I have a witness in here that, that, that can testify that sometimes God goes outside the norm? But we can declare that if we do these things, if we follow in these steps, Acts 2, 38, and the many other ways the order salutis in scripture is lifted up, we can have confidence that salvation is extended to us. And as we live in this moment, as we can hold with confidence and assurance that salvation has been extended to us, we also must continue to wrestle with the reality that at the same time we contend with life and death, the tug of war, the, the, the reality of what is and what is to be. In light of Resurrection Sunday being several weeks past and, and in light of us continuing to endure the pandemic of coronavirus, uh, we still must grapple and wrestle with this very truth, just as Jesus did, that although we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, we hold intention that from a human point of view, Jesus was not saved from death. 
that in order for Jesus to go to the other side of resurrection, his body must and needed to endure the initial impact of death. Jesus had to go through it. He had to transition through it. In order to reach the new, Jesus had to indeed die and create space for the power of resurrection to kick in. I don't know about you, but does not this feel like our current context? That many of us are confronting our collective and our individual mortality. As of this morning, the numbers continue to astound us. The, 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 the impact, the infection, and the, the deaths of uh, this, this season of coronavirus. Uh, the John Hopkins public health site says that 2.9 million people globally have confirmed that they are testing positive for the virus. We've had 828,000 who have fallen sick have recovered, but 204,000 plus have died. And even here in our own country, we can say just based off of those who have been tested that 959,000 Americans have tested positive for the coronavirus. 108,000 of those who fallen ill have recovered, but we have lost over 54,000 of our family members, loved ones, to this virus. And so all of us in this moment are grappling and wrestling with this kind of, at times, dissonant, but, but always with us reality, that we must wrestle with the reality that although we are resurrected people, living and worshiping and following a resurrected Savior, we are experiencing loss around us. I think this is where we must lean into our theological and liturgical commitments and allow them to become a gift for us because we are not the first to endure through the history of the world and particularly the church universal, this, this tug of war of gain and loss this tug of, of, of war, if you will, of struggle and victory, of life and death. And as people who live in light of this resurrection, it is now upon us to make certain decisions through the agency afforded to us by our creator and infused into us by the resurrecting power of God's spirit. You ought to just say that I do have some agency in this moment. We have agency. We have some choices that we can make. And in this moment, you and I must be able to clarify, just as we can with assurance, describe and prescribe the order salutis of our salvation pertaining to our souls, we must come out and through this moment with the ability to clarify what will save us and what will not. You and I must use the agency gifted to us by our creator to become more clear about who is interested in our salvation and who is not. We must, in this moment, if nothing else, emerge from this season with an interrogated faith that is coupled with an informed praxis that creates space for the resurrection to be loosed among us, to spring forth in our lives so we can indeed create and build the new that must emerge. Because quiet as it's kept, above all else, before the economy can be saved, the real you must be preserved. Before the country can recover, the real parts of us that have been harmed and injured, they must be healed. Before our way of life can be fully transformed, the outdated and death-dealing parts of our old ways of life 
must be eschewed and jettisoned. You and I cannot rush to stand up that which God perhaps is asking us to leave in the grave. This work, though hard it may be, is the work we must collectively engage in order to save ourselves from this corrupt era, from this wicked ethos that has concretized in our leadership at both the federal, the state, and the local interests and forces that are not at all times about preserving the vulnerable among us. Oh, we hear conversations all across the country that the government wants to open up for business when it hasn't opened up yet for the healing and recovering of its people. We hear that we are, 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 are being plagued by a rush to participate in and revive a predatory economy when we have not yet spent the wealth of our nation to revive the hopes and the dreams and the, the futures of our own people. And it's just so important for you and I to know that this, this vision and this model of, 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 of recovery in this moment that we see promulgated is not the only one being used in the world. I was, I was reading and talking with a friend of mine, uh, uh, Dr. Otis Moss, who, who was sharing with me how in Denmark, they, 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 they forced their country into a recession, meaning that they looked around at the impact of, of COVID and, and the coronavirus and, and all of the, the ways in which this, this new reality was, was causing the country to, to undergo such trauma, then rather than, than trying to just push through as if things had not changed, the leadership of, of the country of Denmark created what they called a, a, a forced recession, a necessary timeout. They, they went to the corporate leaders and they talked to all the businesses and the corporations and they told them, we will guarantee your company's survival at 75 uh, as long as you uh, hold together the, the, the workers and we'll, 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 we'll guarantee you at about 75% of your network and and we're just going to allow the folks in our country to not have to feel the pressure of trying to rush back to work while our country is still trying to grapple with the reality of healing itself oh i i i want you to know that that all across the country we are seeing uh all kinds of fascinating uh re-emergence of, of animals and of plants and of bugs now that, that many of us are forced to stay inside. I, I even saw a, a, a video of a coyote roaming through the streets of San Francisco at night howling because all the humans are inside. They, they're, they're saying that, that parts of the, the ozone layer and, 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 and our, our world are, are, are going through some, 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 some cleansing because you and I, through this virus, are being forced to stay inside and heal ourselves. I want you to appreciate that even though we did not plan this virus, this virus may be a, a, a reason to embrace a holy disruption in the ways you and I have been living. And it drives this point home, dear loved one, that the real you, the real me, the real us, the part of us that, that is not diminished by our lack of being able to produce, the parts of us that must be protected and must be preserved. This part of you is not expendable. That in this season, your job may be expendable, but the gifts within you are not. The things that you, you are, are able to be a, a source of blessing to many others may be expendable, but you, the one that possessed that, that unique gift, you are not expendable. Our way of life may be expendable, but guess what? Our lives are not expendable. At the end of the day, resurrection is about raising from the dead and keeping alive the part of you that others would let die. 
That resurrection is about just as Jesus rose from the dead with a new body and a new uh, reality, a new sense of, of what could be. Resurrection is also then about you and I, even in this season, rising with a new consciousness of what is and what must be. So when we come then to the text, I just want to hone in on verse number 40 as a way to help you and I think through what does it mean for you and I in this moment? To save ourselves, to use the agency that has been afforded to us through the power of God's spirit to save ourselves. The first thing that I love about verse number 39 in in Acts chapter 2 is the way that the scripture declares the promise is for you. It is for your children and for all who are afar off. It is for everyone that the Lord God calls. We save ourselves, listen, by embracing the promises of God. Yes, yes, yes. Just put that in in, in the chat and say, "I, I can save myself by embracing the promise. I can save myself by embracing the promise. Peter is preaching and he's declaring and he is reminding All of those who will listen that this Jesus whom you have crucified has been raised from the dead and he has been declared and made the Messiah, the one who saves us all. And he goes on then to to describe what what the power and the impact of Jesus salvation means to us. I love uh, the 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 fifth century uh, uh, uh. Pope at the time, St. Leo the Great, they called him. This is how he describes the, the function and the impact of Jesus' salvific work on the cross. He says that when Jesus emptied himself for our sake and for our restoration, listen, it was not for the loss of power. Jesus did not endure this because he lost power, but it was for the manifestation of compassion. The invisible made his substance visible. The intemporal became temporal. The impassable became passable. Not that power might sink into weakness, but that weakness might pass into indestructible power. I want you to just appreciate this for a moment that all of this that happened to Jesus, the the invisible made his substance visible. The intemporal became temporal. The impassable became passable. Not that power might sink into weakness, but that weakness might pass into indestructible power. That the process of Jesus' work was to afford and introduce us to a kind of indestructible power. A a, 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 a way for you and I to emerge with a different kind of access to the God who through God's own work defeated death, hell, and the grave. And so Peter then begins to offer the order salutis that I think is still descriptive and prescriptive for you and I today. Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Listen to this. The promise that you and I must embrace in this moment is that the spirit still fuels repentance. Meaning that the spirit offers you and I what we need to make the U-turn from the lifestyle that creates death. The Spirit fuels us through baptism, a radical cleansing. Uh, The Spirit is saying that through the baptism, the work and act of baptism, I'm going to make you clean. The Spirit, through the receiving and the sending of the Holy Spirit, allows you and I to endure a regeneration, a empowerment. That the promise that you and I must embrace during this quarantine is one that helps us appreciate that I can turn my life into a new kind of way and direction. I can go through this cleansing during this season that I can emerge with new power. This is the promise of God. 
And for many of us, it's important that we rehearse and embrace these promises during this season of quarantine, uh, during the season of coronavirus. There are a couple of scriptures that I, I was blessed by this week during my time of, 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 of study and, and reflection. I'm just going to read a few of them uh, for you. Take out your pen. And begin to take some notes. And then maybe this week you'll, you'll, you'll go back to some of these scriptures. Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 8. This is a promise that God has made. The Lord will go before you and be with you. The Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Psalms 27 verse 1. A very familiar scripture. The Lord is my light. And my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalms 46, verse 1 through 2. You ought to write this one down. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in the time of trouble. Though, therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way. And the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. John 14, 27. This peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. So do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Acts 2, verses 25. I saw the Lord always before me because the Lord is at my right hand. I will not be shaken therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices my body also will rest in hope because the lord will not abandon me to the realm of the dead the lord will not let your holy one see decay you have made known to me the paths of life you will fill me with joy in your presence oh i got two more hebrews 13 i love this one i will never fail you I will never abandon you so we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. So I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? And finally, Revelation chapter 21, verse three. Oh, I love this one. And I heard a voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And God will dwell with them. Woo, I want you to know that God's dwelling place is now your home. It's now your trouble. It's now your struggle. It's now your grief and your mourning. It's your questions. God says, my dwelling place is now among the people. And they will be God's people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. God will wipe every tear from their eye. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away and he who has seated on the right hand of the throne is saying I am making everything new these are the promises these are the promises that you and I must embrace even in this season I want to challenge you Keep embracing these promises of God. Rehearse them in your mind. Write them on some postcards. Put them on your mirror. Put them in your, 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 over your stove. Put them over your TV. Put them in your pocket. Put them on your phone. Put them on your screensaver of your computer. But whatever you do, rehearse the promises of God in this season so you can embrace them first question then i want you to i want you to think about what promises from god require your rehearsing in this season where have you felt let down or disappointed acknowledge where you felt let down and disappointed and how does the truth of resurrection allow you to re-embrace these promises for you your family and all who are afar off the second thing that I want to lift up for you uh, for the next few moments is that not only must we embrace the promises, but we must also release the corruption. Verse number 40 says, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. In the Greek, this word also means perverse. It means things that are terribly, terribly uh, uh, in inverted and upside down. Uh, you and I in this moment must ask ourselves, what is so perverse about this generation that we must save ourselves from? 
And I want you to think about it. All the profiteering, the exploitation of the poor. We've even seen this week that that this president uh, and, and many of those who support him, they prey on the simple minded among us. Because anyone that would hear someone encourage you to drink bleach and to ingest aerosol products with the hope of cleansing yourself from the inside out and would follow that, they are indeed feeble-minded, which these kind of folks are described in the scriptures. So we should not necessarily feel ill will towards them. We should feel compassion for them, but we should also declare that this kind of declarations from the highest seats of power in our country is a sign of the corruption among us. And that's why I believe that we must do all that we can to resist the language of war as we go through this pandemic. I've said it many times in many other places that that we are not at war with a virus any more than you are at war with the earthquakes when they rock your home, any more than we are at war with tornadoes and hurricanes when they ravage communities. We're not at war with a virus. These kinds of viruses are a part of the, the ecological makeup and environment of this world. But we are at war with the mendacity of political leaders. We are at war with the ignorance of the death cult of supporters that would, would indeed follow this wickedness in high places. We are at war with principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and wickedness in high places, but we are not at war with our neighbor. We are not at war with other countries. This is a time where the church, where the people of God, where all of humanity must look in the mirror and say the way we defeat this, this season of, of sickness and disease is radical charity. It is radical solidarity. It is radical compassion that in this moment we must release the corruption and we must figure out who the real enemy is. And in your own life, if we do not get clear about who the corruption and where the corruption and the enemy lie, we can be at war with the wrong folk and extend a crisis rather than shorten its lifespan. So even in this moment, you got to ask yourself gently, but still ask yourself, how can I discern what I am saving myself from? in this season. Some of us must save ourselves from hopelessness. Some of us must save ourselves from an unhealthy diet. Some of us must save ourselves from the pressure to return too soon to work and prop up a failed economy. Some of us must save ourselves from radical individualism that makes you think that you and your family are the only ones that really matter in this world. Some of us must save ourselves from the kind of practices that erase our humanity rather than color in the many lines and the ways that our humanity resonates one with another. Uh, I want you to keep telling yourself that in this moment, there are things that we must release. We must fight the right kinds of fights. Let's not fight one another. This week, we are seeing still in East Oakland and parts of the country where large numbers of our urban youth, our black and brown youth are still outside and they're not socially distancing. And one of the main responses from the government is to unleash the law enforcement apparatus on our children and on our young people and on even some adults. In this season, I want to declare that that is not the way we respond in a humanitarian in crisis. Our response must be one of a big public education campaign. What would it look like if some of us who knew some of these young folks actually girded ourselves up, made sure that we were protected, and we went out and we, we bore witness to them and we helped explain to them what is at stake? What would it look like for us to continue to get masks and PPE for the people to make sure that we had food in, in supply? What would it mean for many of us who have a lot during this season to not be, be seduced by the narratives of scarcity and leave one another to their own devices. 
Those responses are residue of the corruption of this generation. But God is inviting you and I to be saved from the corruption that is scarcity, that is profiteering, that is exploitation. So how can I release these things from my life and do the necessary engagement that helps us to save ourselves? And then finally, child of God today, my question to us is, can we emerge anew? Verse 41 declares that everyone who heard this message, everyone who heard what was being declared, received the message and were baptized. I want you to understand that there will be a new emerging. Baptism is a wonderful metaphor. It's a wonderful description, theological and praxeological, a, a practical description of what happens when we receive the possibility of the new with great intentionality. Baptism at its core is about us being buried with Christ and being re raised from the, the, the waters anew. And I want you to see this season as an opportunity for us to emerge anew. It is indeed the fact that not all of us will experience the same weight of grief, the same weight of loss. Not all of us will come through this with the same access to opportunity and the same access to our, our, our previous way of life. But that is in my and our hope an opportunity to embrace a new, a new sense of life that is emerging around us. Just like when you are buried in the waters of baptism and you come up anew, my prayer is that as we are being buried in this pandemic, that we will emerge anew with a new way of life. That we will accept the possibility of this new way of life that requires a new version of us. This is what you and I must do to save ourselves. We must depend on the power of resurrection, the work of Jesus, the solidarity of the saints, the, the stewardship of creation, the, the, the goodwill of our neighbor, our friend. We must turn our eyes now to one another. We must say, what must we do to save ourselves from this wicked generation? I think that God has given us what we need through the power of God's spirit, through the, the hope of our faith, and through the shared community of the saints. May we indeed save ourselves. Psalm says, soon as I stop worrying, worrying how the story is, when I let go and I let God, oh, I let God have God's way, that's when things start happening. When I stop looking at back then, when I let go and I let God, oh, I let God have God's way. God, I pray right now for every person, Lord God, that is with us, every person that in their own homes, within their own communities, within their own spaces, God, are continuing to make our way through this season. God, we know that Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. And God, we are enduring a long night. Loved ones are falling ill. Loved ones are dying and transitioning. Loved ones, Lord God, are losing jobs and being and finding themselves, Lord, struggling to make 
sense of where their help will come from. But I pray and declare right now, God, that even in this moment, Lord, we must and we can embrace your promise. All the many promises that you have made, God, I pray that we will grab a hold to them and not let them go. I pray, God, that in this season we will release the corruption that is around us that we may be holding on to out of a sense of normalcy or out of a sense of not knowing what will fill its place. May we release that that corruption, that, that sense of loyalty to failed systems and a failed way of life. May we look at ourselves and be set free from the things and the practices, Lord, that keep us from being saved. And God, may we, even with eyes of faith, be able to see the new that is emerging. Lord God, the opportunities that are emerging. Lord, the new way of life that we are helping to co-create. May we, God, have a radical imagination. May this moment not, Lord, drain us of our ingenuity. Drain us, Lord God, of our ability to see those things that are not as though they are. But may we, your people, who have survived worse conditions in our history, may we continue with eyes of faith see the emerging new day that is to come and may we take care of one another on this journey to the new and we'll say thank you God we'll say thank you God we'll say thank you God in Jesus mighty name we pray come on just remind people in your comments in the mentions that we will save ourselves we will be sustained. We are not expendable. We are not fodder for the whims of this empire, but we will save ourselves through the power of God's grace at work in our lives. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We thank God for all of you that joined us this week. We thank God for all of you that took the time out to hang out with us on this Sunday. I pray that you experience the full blessings of God. I pray that you will this week plug in and get connected and don't 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 just stay out there alone trying to make this journey. I know some of us are on Zoom calls, we're on hangouts, we're on FaceTime all week. Do a Zoom a call or a hangout with somebody that makes you laugh. Do a Zoom, a call, or a hangout with somebody that will pray with you. Make a commitment to get out and walk this week. Find a park. Find a balcony. Find some spaces where you can just look and hear the birds and all of creation healing itself. And as creation heals itself, so may we heal ourselves as well. We love you with the love of the Lord. Be blessed this week. We pray we'll re connect with you throughout this week Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday 12 noon meet us on our Facebook page at the way and we'll get a great devotional, a great way to connect one with another find a belonging group find some folks to connect and be in relationship with one another and whatever you do remember that God is with us and we will get through this God will never leave us nor forsake us. God will hold us together as we save ourselves. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. It's Pastor Mike and the Way Church.